Hello, this, uh, this video is a, a just a quick refresher course on the theories in psychology. As you know, theories exist in every field, and psychology is no exception, and there are quite a few in psychology. We're going to focus on the ones in personality, motivation, emotion, sensation and perception, biology, and social psych. And keep in mind that everything in this video is an oversimplification. It's just a refresher course, and it's uh, not going to go in-depth in any one of these theories. First, with personality theories, you've got Freud and the psychoanalytic theory. Uh, he had some followers known as social psychoanalytic theorists, or neo-Freudians, and that includes Jung, Adler, Erickson, and more, and they had their own theories. Check out the personality uh, theorists' uh, videos for that. The behavioral theories include Skinner's, Skinner and Watson and Rescorla, and many others. The humanistic theories involve Rogers, Maslow, and a few others. And trait theories involve McCray and Costa. Not going to go into detail with uh, those particular ones for this refresher. Gate control theory uh, gets into pain reception, so sometimes sensation of perception, sometimes um, some other areas, uh, depending on your textbook. But it's a 1962 theory of pain, or nocive reception. And the idea is that pain exists around the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, and that there are thin or pain fibers, and there are larger fibers that are sensitive for touch, pressure, and vibration. And if there's more activity in the large fibers, less pain is felt since the gate is closed by the large fiber input. Now, this is an outdated theory, and more modern biological theories have replaced it with the idea of pain thresholds involving factors of ethnicity, genetics, sex, and individual circumstances. Drive reduction theory is, in with, is within the motivation unit. Clark Hull created the idea of the uh, drive being an excitatory state produced by homeostatic disturbance. The idea that our bodies strive for homeostasis or balance is key with this theory. We can take action to reduce the tension, and our primary drives are hunger, thirst, and sex. And so if we are thirsty, we will find a way to reduce that particular drive. We will drink something. Secondary drives, learned by conditioning, for example, money, um, that has some, some issues related to drive reduction theory, uh, some criticisms. Uh, but ultimately, how individuals meet those particular needs or drives are going to be idiosyncratic, which is to say they're going to be individual to the individual. There's incentive theory within organizational behavior, human resources or management theory. People are motivated to do things because of external rewards or incentives. So it's just like it sounds. So getting paid, getting free food, getting the gold star, um, those are going to be part of incentive theory. Expectancy theory is, again, within motivation and organizational behavior. And it's about the cognitive process of making a decision. Our main motivation is going to be based on the desirability of the outcome of what we choose to do. That is, how closely are the expected results of a choice going to match up with the desired goals that we have? Arousal theory is uh, involving what is known as Yerkes Dodson Law, and the idea is the inverted U curve here. Uh, the performance in attention, memory, and problem solving increases with a level of physiological or mental arousal, but only up to a point. When the levels of physiological arousal become too high, performance decreases. So if you've ever been too amped up for a test or too amped up for an athletic competition, your uh, over-arousal makes your performance uh, decrease. There's the idea of the facial feedback hypothesis, and that's the idea that one's facial expressions can have a feedback on one's emotional experience. And the, the demonstration that I like to do in class is I have my students put a pencil in their teeth, but without letting the with their, without letting their lips touch the pencil. And of course that creates a smiling um, set of uh, muscle use in the face. And then there's the other one where you put a pencil in your mouth but you do like a duck face and you stick your lips out and you hold your pencil without using the teeth. And that uses the same muscles as a frown. And so this demo actually reflects the James Lang theory of emotion. Theories of emotion, you can check those out in another video, but you've got the two-factor or the Singer-Schachter or the Schachter-Singer um, uh, labeling theory. The key thing here is the cognitive label, two factors, the physiology and the label. That's the one that's most uh, accepted today. There's the James Lang, physio first, then emotion, and then the Cannon bard Emotion comes from the hypothalamus and dorsal thalamus stimulation. And uh, so you've got those three theories of emotions, more detail in another video. There's the general adaptation theory, or the general adaptation syndrome. Hans Sale, a stress and physiology researcher. The general adaptation syndrome is alarm, 
resistance, and exhaustion. And that's involving the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis system that deals with stress. So the hypothalamus sends signals to the pituitary gland, which sends signals to the adrenal gland. And that axis system will help create um, the sympathetic response, sympathetic nervous system response. Then there's the stress prevention and adaptive coping uh, and the ability to have resilience. Those are going to be keys to coping. So go back and check out that stress chapter um, tonight when you're preparing for your AP exam. In sensation and perception, there's the signal detection theory. How to tell the difference between information-bearing patterns, or stimulus, and distractions, that background noise. So let's say you're in a classroom, and your teacher's trying to tell you something, but there's a lot of little side conversations, or paper rustling, or chair moving, or traffic outside, all those other things. What's the difference between the signal and the noise, or the stimulus and the noise? This, all, this theory also involves absolute threshold, what's the minimum level at which we can perceive something, and also the difference threshold, or the just noticeable difference. How much change has to occur for us to be able to see it and notice it. Color vision, there's the trichromatic theory, also known as the young Helmholtz theory, it involves rods and cones, and the cones, there are three kinds uh, in the retina. There's kinds that pick up the red, the green, or the blue, depending on the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation. The reality is, is that there are more than three uh, kinds of cones that pick up different um, levels in the uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Um, just as a side note, check out this and the other color theory. Um, it's very, very cool stuff when you get a chance after the AP exam. Also color theory, there's the opponent process theory. And then the idea is that the visual system interprets info about color by processing signals in a set of opposites. So black, white, red, green, uh, blue, yellow. Um, because the waves in the trichromatic theory overlap, it's more efficient to use this system in the brain to respond to differences within these set, three sets of opposites. Uh, and also with this theory, the bipolar and ganglion cells have additional processing uh, to do uh, in, in picking up and perceiving color. Then there's attribution theory. This comes out of the social psychology theory. Fritz Heider did some work with this. Attribution, how we explain people's behavior, including our own or other people's behavior. Is it going to be an internal or dispositional kind of a, an attribution or explanation? Or is it going to be external or situational? The FAE, or the fundamental attribution error, is discounting the situational factors in explaining behavior. Oh, poor people, um, they, they live in the slums because they like to live that way, is an example of a fundamental attribution error. A lot of stereotyping uh, is involved with this as well. And then there's the actor-observer bias. How we explain our own behavior is going to be often different than when we are the observer explaining other people's behavior. And of course, there's the self-serving bias, which is pretty self, hopefully self-explanatory. Those are the theories. Thanks for watching.